So yeah, I wanted to ask you about about the alphabet specifically. Like first of all, as a student yourself, how, how do you go mm -hmm. about it, or how how was your experience when mm -hmm. you got to to that part? Yeah, I'm gonna turn my camera and write on a board that's over oh. on the wall behind me. Yep. Um, right. So there, I'll write I'll write the same word in in Chinese. Let me think. Ah, okay. So this is a character, and it, it, this happens to mean chicken. In okay. Mandarin, we pronounce it ji. So there's a way to transliterate that sound, and it looks like that. Right. So they do use an alphabet in, in the pinyin system of transliterating Chinese, but there's nothing here that's like an alphabet. There's nothing in this character that tells me it sounds like that. What, what the character tells me is, this thing is is actually it's it's a simplified character so i'm i can't remember what the original looked like it looked a little bit more like a bird i think over there um this this part actually means something to do with your hand um i suspect it had some relationship to the sound of the word i'm not sure um, but often there's a part there that will either remind you of the general gist of the sound something similar to the sound and something else in there will remind you of the meaning often 80 80 85 percent of the characters are like that so over here on this side which i never write very beautifully that that part is a bird and maybe you can see the bird here's the head up here okay okay Got and there's it. kind of the maybe the wing yep, there, yep. and sort of the it. front of the bird and mm -hmm. yeah eyeball right there yeah so um that appears in many, many different characters for something related to some kinds of birds. So when you find out, oh, that's chicken, and then there's this part there, okay, that's going to trigger my memory. It means some kind of a bird. Oh, it means the part that maybe sounds sort of like that. Maybe. I don't know if that's, that component has a sound that's similar, to be honest. Sometimes it does, sometimes it doesn't. Because they've been written for thousands of years, the changes in the sound system have those have changed, but sometimes the character remains the same. So it doesn't always have a relationship between the sound and the meaning yeah. of the character necessarily. But uh, but so so there is some guide. Um, but Chinese people do not read this as if this is the language. This is like when we look in a dictionary to look up English words. There's the phonetic pronunciation of the word next to the spelling of the word. This is like that pronunciation of the word. This is the real word. Right. And so if you're not reading in characters, you're missing a lot, a lot. You're just getting sounds of Chinese and you're not connecting to the meaning and the historic connections that the language has within itself. So I find it actually after a point, it's easier to know characters than to try to continue to just work off of the phonetic system. So the way um, I learned it, I learned all this stuff together and all that stuff that I said about, you know, this, this means this and this, like we analyzed the characters as we learned them, as the word was new, as we were trying to pick up the sound. So how many is that? Like history of the character and sound, meaning, appearance of the character, different components. So like five or six different aspects of one word at a time. That's a lot. Yeah. So what I do now is separate these two steps. So I work when their words are new and the learner is a beginner, I work with pinyin while they're kind of in that initial, oh, I'm hearing that word, what does that mean? So what I'd have on the board would be none of this. And I would have this. And as I say the word ji, I would go over here and point and look at the students and see that they're tracking approximately, you know, and then continue to use that word in the context of other words that they know. Uh, do you have chickens? Do you like chickens? Do you see any chickens? I do because they live back behind our house. right now. Mm -hmm. So using that while the word is becoming familiar and then when we're ready to read, this goes away because they don't need it now. They know this, so they're connecting sound to meaning. And when I see that that's getting pretty firm for everybody, I figure, okay, now we can show what it looks like. So when we read in my classes, often at the end of class, we'll start where I'll be typing and I'll ask students for like, well, what should, what should we start our reading to look like? And then I'll, 
I'll extend it and finish it after class. But let's say if this word was new, I'd want to put that in there like 10 or more times. I got that from Terry Waltz, who does a lot of training for Mandarin Chinese teachers. Um, she suggests like 10 to 20 times to, to see that new word in print the first time you're reading it. And then over time, you're going to see it again. Uh, but that first time you're kind of loading in lots of opportunity to go, ah, oh, that's G. Oh, G looks like that. Well, you know, so the idea is like, this is so strong. The sound and the meaning is so strong. All you're doing when you're reading is just adding, mm, that's what it looks like. And then later on, we do the analysis of the parts of the character, where's maybe the historical development of the character, if that's fun for students, or there's a good reason to do that. Okay rather than doing it all at once. So it also like a researcher who is actually one of my dissertation committee professors. Thank you, Dr. Michael Everson. Um, he talked about it being a process view of reading. So looking at it like we can work with Pinyin for a while and then have them read the same text. In his case, it was like everything was Pinyin for um, several weeks of class. And then everything switched to characters, no new words, just read the words you've already heard. And so his idea was like, if we can give them that, that first experience just with oral language, like a Chinese child, and then add the reading um, when they, they have developed some language ability, then that's gonna be better for them. Then try to do it all together. Cause you know, five right. different things about every word is very but, burdensome. Mm -hmm. But I was thinking, do you think the opinion part is a necessary stepping stone or <clears throat> could you go straight to character equals to characters. chicken or character equals and a picture of a chicken? I'm just thinking about it. In the, in the case of some immersion programs, I've, I've heard some do that. Like with like kindergarten and first grade kids. They'll, and I think that in China, that's the way they do it too. Let me think. In preschool, I think they just show them characters. First grade, I believe first grade, they also are just looking at characters. And then in second grade, I think, or maybe maybe it's first grade is the transition. They start kids who are already kind of semi-literate in characters and they see them everywhere they go. So there's constant exposure to characters. Their minds are tracking with characters in a way you and I would not so much growing up in an environment without characters around us all the time. Right, right. So I, in the case of like a Chinese child, I think that's where they start. And then they add, they do add pinyin afterwards though, okay. because they want standard pronunciation across the country of Mandarin. So there are regional dialects that still exist, but in order to communicate across the whole country, they, they have a standardized right. language that people are all taught. So pinyin comes in for that. Mm -hmm. For Westerners who have an alphabet background, the problem I think is not, not so much using pinyin, but it's using pinyin over the character and showing that all the time and right. trying to expect someone who's trained to read alphabet languages, just, oh, just ignore that. Yeah, not going to happen. <laughs> You're not going to happen. So if you want me to read characters, don't show me pinyin with it. I mean, absolutely. Yeah, 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 yeah. Like if you have both, one, yeah, it just, it's like, it's like yeah. watching a movie in the target language with subtitles in your own native language. Your mind's going to go to the yeah. native language, right? Yeah. yeah, naturally, it's where you're stronger. Yeah. Um, and, and Chinese teachers, if anybody's watching, they, they'll say, but in second grade in China, this is what we give students. We do give them a text that has characters and pinyin, and they do fine. Again, who are those children? What is their language exposure? They are fluent in Chinese already. It's, they have the ear for Chinese already. The language makes sense to them. They're growing vocabulary, but they know Chinese. Your non-native student who has 100 hours of class time per year, or 150 maybe, that, that student does not have this strong language in their mind that they have grown from their birth. And so they are a different kind of learner than, than a native Chinese child who's exposed to language all the time. So when the second grader also, who has seen characters from their birth, constantly surrounding them and seeing mom and dad or family or their teacher reading things aloud from signs on TV. If you watch TV in China, everything is subtitled in characters. It's to promote literacy. So kids, grow up constantly seeing this their minds are not going what is that 
like an alphabet trained mind kind of has a natural reaction like to see the difference in characters is is really kind of challenging at first right. they need more time and so you know when the second grader in china can do this and and can kind of visually ignore pinyin except where they need it well, because their mind is already keyed in on characters have meaning and i did not have that background and so I right. think the approach can differ to get to the same goal, which is reading texts that don't have this and just reading characters and reading it and connecting to the sound of standard Mandarin. Right, right, so right. That's, that's my plug for Chinese reading. <laughs> there we go. <laughs>